Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll see some special stories uh, from Teddy Roosevelt. But first, joining me now is Ava Hill, Miss International. Miss International. Ava, thanks for joining us Thank today. you so much for having me. Uh, the reason I stumbled because I started to say Miss North Dakota International, but you won it all. So. I did, yes. I'm the first Miss North Dakota International to take the whole title, to take Miss International. Well, congratulations. Thank you so much. Well, as, as we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, maybe where you're originally from. Yeah, so I'm a homegrown North Dakota girl. I'm from Kinder, North Dakota, which is a very small town south of Fargo here. Um, you know, I grew up in an incredible family. Anything I could ever want. I was a martial artist. I was a dancer. And I always had these big dreams. I wanted to be a singer. I wanted to be a performer. But I never saw them as really a possibility. And when I saw my mother crowned Mrs. North Dakota International, all of those dreams kind of became a reality. And I thought, well, why can't I? Why can't I be a singer? Why can't I be a dancer and a performer? Um, and when I got older, again, that reality kind of kicked in. And I was like, well, maybe I can't. Um, and I eventually started struggling with uh, self body image, uh, low self confidence. I had a, a, severe, uh, a severe anti bull or a serious cyber bullying and harassment situation that led mm -hmm. to me ultimately attempting to take my life mm -hmm. when I was 18 years old in 2015. And from there, again, I was low in my self confidence. I really didn't see a purpose for myself. And my mother recommended that I compete in a pageant. And I was like, hold up, absolutely not. I was not the pageant type. I had purple and gray hair piercings, tattoos, you name it. And she said, you know, just try it. Just try it, find yourself a purpose, find yourself a platform that you can represent and you can present to the public. And the second I entered the pageant, I knew that my purpose was to share my story of suicide prevention and perseverance throughout my reign. And I've done just that internationally. Hmm. Well, we'll talk about that a little more, uh, a little later, but first t tell us what is the Miss International pageant and maybe how that differs from Miss America or Miss USA. Miss International is truly a phenomenal organization. It's a community service and family based organization. It's very unique in the sense that it has not only the Miss title but it has Mrs. Teen and Preteen as well. So it really focuses on a wide range of women and it focuses on more beyond beauty. It focuses on our community initiatives like mine being suicide prevention and it encourages women to make so many differences in the world around us. Mm -hmm. So so really, what is the difference? Because it sounds like, yeah, you obviously have a state pageant and mm -hmm. then, then a national pageant. Yeah. Miss America, Miss USA have both of those. Yes, so yeah. not only do we compete against the other states, but we compete against multiple other countries. So while I was at Miss International, I was competing against you know, Rhode Island and California, but I was also competing against India and South Africa and you know, so many other countries mm. I can hardly name. So it really is a global organization. Sure, okay. I uh, always hate this question, but you know, I feel like we have to ask, how shocked were you that you won? Oh my gosh, if you ever see the pictures, my <laughs> face hit the floor. It was unbelievable. Again, I'm the first Miss North Dakota to ever win. We never thought we would have a winner, and it was truly a spectacular moment that I will never forget, and it's a moment where everything in my life really came full circle, and it was just spectacular. Mm -hmm. Now the pageant was actually July it was, 2019. Yes. So uh, what has your you know first six or eight months been like and, and you know it has been insane. I travel every single week to a new location. I'm on a school tour for my Hearts for Hope presentations and then I'm also representing the Peyton Hart Project globally. I was in Nicaragua in November. I just got back from Washington D.C. this week speaking with Ke uh, Kevin Kramer. So it has been a whirlwind, but that's all part of the job, and it's just amazing. Yeah. Well, you talked a little bit about it, and uh, your platform. Yes. Uh, promoting uh, suicide prevention. Of course, it's, uh, as you've said, it's a personal issue for it you. Is. Can, can you expand on that a little more and, and, and what you're able to do when you go out? Yeah, so I'm a global representative and ambassador for an organization called the Peyton Hart Project. I initially found this organization shortly after my suicide attempt in 2015. And what really struck me with this organization being so different is it was a way to present the information and open up the very serious topic with ages, you know, three years old and up. And how we do that is with handcrafted hearts with resources on them and inspirational quotes for others to find. And it's a way to present the information and present 
hope and resources to those who may need them most. And as I've been partnered with them, I created Hearts for Hope presentations so I can present that information in schools and community organizations all over the world. Yeah. yeah. What are you know, some of the signs that somebody might be contemplating suicide? Oh my goodness, anything from loss of interest in things that were once pleasurable, feeling fatigued and tired all the time, irritability, um, giving away possessions, um, feeling that they're a burden to others. These are some serious things that you should look for. Also anxiety, feeling worried all the time. And if you notice these in a friend or family member, never be afraid to acknowledge that because someone who's struggling with depression, struggling with suicidal thoughts, they're either trying to justify their behavior or they're unaware of it themselves. So if a loved one sees that, you know, they need to step up and say, you know, I love you and we need to fix this. Yeah, and, and you mentioned, an eight, you said three, three years old. Yes, I speak from ages three to 65 plus. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, right. and you mentioned Peyton Hart Project. Can you expand on that a little bit about what that is? Yes, the Peyton Hart Project is a global suicide prevention and anti-bullying organization. It was founded in 2015 in honor of Peyton James, who unfortunately took his life at the age of 13 years old in 2014. Um, he was known for his legacy of being kind and just spreading so much joy throughout the world. And his father, David, along with the founders, Jill Kubin and Sue Harris, wanted to share that legacy, and they created the Peyton Hart Project to spread resources and spread hope and, and to share that light and legacy throughout the world. And they've done just that. It's been to every U.S. state in over 65 countries now. I myself have been to 25 states, I think, is the count in three countries, and I've made 15,000 of these hearts, scattering them all over the world. And it has reached all corners from the Eiffel Tower to the Great Wall of China. So we've made a huge difference in the world. <laughs> And then you mentioned the Hearts of Hope uh, presentation yes. that you created. Tell yes. us more about that. So primarily what I wanted to do as an ambassador and ultimately what I wanted to do as a title holder for the Miss International organization was reach as many age groups as possible because suicide is the second leading cause of death ages 10 to 34. We have 10 year olds attempting to take their own life and that was just tragic to me. And I had to find a way to present this information starting young. And how I did that was I created four presentations developed and geared toward four different age groups starting at three years old. And what we do is we read a story called Have You Filled Your Bucket Today, which is about spreading kindness and ways we can do that and how that can affect others around us. And I talk about the Peyton Hearts and how they can fill buckets. And then we go into middle school and talking about cyberbullying and anti-bullying and how these hearts are a way to um, mitigate that and to just spread kindness and be nice to each other. And then we get into high school and um, college, adulthood, where we talk about suicide, mental health, suicide prevention, anti-bullying, stalking, harassment situations. And we get really to the meat of it and talk about how we can pre prevent this and lessen the impact all around us. Hmm. Again, for me, you know, a three-year-old or a seven-year-old, I, I can't even imagine why, why a, a person that young would think about taking their life. Is, is it uh, what are things that create that situation for them? You know, is it bullying? Is it, yeah, what, what? Yeah, something about suicide that's often forgotten about, it's incredibly complex. You know, oftentimes we see um, articles in the media, you know, on Facebook or wherever, and they say, you know, bullying caused this young person to take their life, and that creates such a uh, painful stigma. And what we want to do is to focus it in a different direction and realize that it's incredibly complex. Bullying wasn't the ultimate cause. It could be financial burden, it could be bullying, it could be their family getting a divorce, um, feeling insecure about themselves. There are so many factors that go into play, even with young children wanting to take their life. Hmm. You know, you talked about yourself, and, and it's, it's great that you're able to share this with so many people, but did you hide your warning signs from family and friends? I did. I actually kept my attempt a secret for around two years. So I didn't come out with my story until I was around 19, 20 years old. And I always was a very independent and strong person, but this was a weight that I couldn't bear to carry on my own. And I was so fortunate to have my friends and family right there to support me along the way. My parents were there every step of the way, helping me find individuals to talk to and helping me feel um, like I had a purpose and like I had a, a meaning to to my life and as to why I needed to be here. And that's so important and that's what I always recommend others to help find, not only talking to a therapist and reaching out to resources, but have a support system there and a sense of community. Mm -hmm. And you're almost answering this, but you know, what steps should a family take or, or, or say me mm -hmm. with, with my child if, if I suspect 
that they're, they're uh, well, if they've attempted suicide is one thing, but yes. if I suspect that something's going on. Don't be afraid to bring it to their attention. I did mention this when I was listing the, the signs, but never be afraid to bring it to their attention, even if it seems like they're going to be embarrassed or be angry. Let them know that you notice these signs. Let them know that you care. And then go through the proper uh, sources to find the proper care. Oftentimes that's a really hard process for an individual who's struggling on their own to do because it is so hard to find the proper care. So leading them through that process, finding a therapist, reaching out to resources like American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. They have lists in your state of places you can go and people to see and helping them find those resources and find the best fit for them. And also encouraging them to see their um, primary doctor to get a checkup and see how they're doing physically. Mm -hmm. You, you talked about speaking to groups and yes. people about this and, uh, you know, what, what's it like to talk to people and, and especially in groups and things like that? Well, it's so funny. I'm sure all of my English teachers back in Kindred are just laughing hysterically because I was just petrified to speak and now it's my job for a living. Um, but it's incredible. Uh, yet just yesterday I was in Cullum, North Dakota speaking to the entire school K through 12 and you know, every single time I have an appearance, I have a line of kids wanting to talk to me about their story, how suicide's affected their life, what they're currently going through, and as heartbreaking as it is, it's reassuring to know that these kids are finally developing the courage to speak up and reach out for help and open up about what they're experiencing because that's ultimately what's going to save a life, is opening that discussion and providing resources and knowing that there's people there to listen. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> you, you talk to a lot of people, it sounds like, and. Can, can, is, are there some people you can talk about that maybe you've, you've helped on the road to recovery? I can't, of course, release any names, but no, um, just, oh my God, my first presentation, I was just petrified. This was the first time I was really releasing my story. It was the first time I w finally had that purpose in myself, and I was so confident, and I go up there, and I see a young girl very eager to be in my presentation with a crown on my head, and she immediately started crying when I brought up the topic of suicide. And I was like, oh my goodness, what did I say incorrectly? What did I do wrong? And I finished up my presentation and she was the first one in line at my meet and greet. And she said, thank you so much for talking about survivors of suicide loss because I just lost my boyfriend yesterday. And um, she didn't know where to go and what to do because oftentimes there aren't resources for those who lose a loved one. Um, and so that was reassuring for my first presentation that I, I was hopefully making a difference in someone's life. And, you know, that's one of hundreds of stories of people that come up to me every day. Hmm. Yeah. Well, let's switch gears now for a moment. Uh, let's talk about your work as, as a makeup artist. Yes. So I started a business at 19 years old, Ava Hill Artistry. I went to Faces Etc. of Minnesota, which is a makeup artist artistry school in Minneapolis. And I started my business right off the bat. I started working in the film industry as a special effects artist. So I did. You know, anything from glam to gore, which I'm sure people are surprised about, but I absolutely loved it. And once I won Miss North Dakota and Miss International, uh, this became my full-time job. So I've taken a little bit of a break from the makeup artistry world, but I'll be back in it soon enough. Well, Madeline uh, dug deep here a little bit. Uh, we understand uh, you auditioned for, for The Voice at age 15. Can you I tell did. us about that experience? It was crazy. I, I think the NDA is officially gone, but <laughs> well, um, but it was incredible. Like I mentioned earlier, I wanted to be a singer so badly. I just idolized so many singers like Carrie Underwood and Miranda Lampert at the time, and now I'm more into like Adele. But I auditioned and there were like 10,000 people at this audition and you would walk into this teeny tiny room like a cubicle at an office and you'd sing your heart out with someone singing opera and country right next to you and it was incredible. I didn't make it, but it was a really fun experience. It had to be it, uh, tremendous. Uh, with that though, let, explain a little more about your, I uh, understand you play guitar. I do, yes. I taught myself how to play guitar when I was quite young. My Grandparents were in a bluegrass band and they played all over the country and music kind of just ran in my blood. My father plays the guitar and sings and music was always something that really brought me home. And so I've been writing music and, and playing music for a long time and it's something that brings a lot of comfort to my life. Well, you, you mentioned uh, Adele, uh, Miranda Lambert, Carrie Underwood. Yes. So what kind of music do you, do you lean towards the country or what do you write? Um, I'm more of an alternative writer. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely have some folksy characters from my background, so that's something that, again, it, it's homey, and it, it, it reminds me of where I come from. Mm -hmm. 
you talked about some of your travels, but let, let's get a little more specific. You've got another few months uh, yes. left. Uh, what will that be like? Well, it's going to be as busy as I hope, it, I hope I'm planning it. I'm going back to Nicaragua. I just got back in November. I'm going to be going back in the spring. We do a mission trip out there where we work with a community in El Recreo, which is in Managua. Um, this is just an incredible mission trip. I do my Hearts for Hope presentations with them. We've made hundreds of hearts with the community members. We provide food and resources for them um, because it is a third world country, so we want to do what we can to help um, bring them some hope and bring them some help. I'm also going to be doing my school tour. I'm going to South Dakota, Minnesota, California. I'll be in Florida in February, and so it's going to be very busy but very exciting. Well, so uh, will you, I guess, are you part of the July when, when there, I assume in July there'll yes. be a new Miss International crown. Will you get to be there and? I will, yes, it'll be in Kingsport, Tennessee this year. I'll crown the, my new successor, which is, I can't believe going to happen. I can't believe I'm a Miss International crowning a Miss International, but I'll be done with my reign and ready to move on and, and excited to watch the next girl. Yeah. Uh, do you even have any idea what those feelings are gonna be like as you, as you pass the crown off but that won't stop your work, I don't think. Oh, absolutely not. I, it will be bittersweet because you, you grow to just love the industry and love what you do and the title becomes a huge part of you, but ultimately it's not the crown that makes the difference you do. I, I always have a cheesy quote that says, um, one crown can't change the world, but one crown had changed my world forever. You know, I wouldn't be standing here today as a published journalist and a woman of the year nominee and an ambassador of the year in Miss International if I hadn't competed in a pageant in the first place. It led me to so many opportunities and things I never thought I was capable of doing before. And that's because some random person put a crown on my head. But it was the ultimate honor and it's led me to making a huge difference in being an ambassador and raising awareness for suicide prevention. Yeah, well, with the Miss International though, you know, especially when you're in maybe North Dakota, you probably know some of those people who are in the, in the pageant. But with the Miss International, do you even stay in contact with any of those contestants? Oh, yes. We have a running group message that goes on today. We have girls getting married and going on vacations. We're planning a reunion. So we stay very close and in contact. Miss Australia and I were really good friends. Miss Africa and I are still really good friends. So it's created such a community of like-minded women who are out there making a huge difference in the world. And it was an incredible experience to not only meet them, but still call them really good friends. Wow. And you would have never had that had you not gotten into that no, first pageant. No, uh, you know, You've mentioned a little bit about inspirations in your life. Can you talk about maybe some of the people who have really influenced you and inspired you? Uh, my mother, she was a former Mrs. North Dakota International 2004. She ran seven times for this title, seven times in a row, and I, I watched her accomplish incredible things. She got a multi-million dollar grant for her organization. She got letters from Oprah. And on top of that, she raised two kids, and she raised a Miss International. Well, do, accomplishing her goals, creating state winning, national winning teams from our school district. She inspired me to do so many things and I would not be Miss International without her. Well, uh, that's great. I guess we need to kind of wrap it up. Yes. If people want to find out more and uh, want more information, where could they go? To learn more about the Peyton Hart Project, mm -hmm. they can visit the www.thepeytonhartproject.org or their Peyton Hart Project Facebook page and Instagram. If they want to learn more about me or follow my journey, they can follow me at Miss INTL19 or Miss International Ava Hill. Ava, thanks so much for joining us Thank today. Thank you so much for having me. Stay tuned for more. Theodore Roosevelt accomplished many things as the 26th President of the United States, including wildlife preservation and the creation of the National Park System. Remembering Theodore Roosevelt, featuring the words of Roosevelt as read by Steve Stark. In March of 1903, President Roosevelt created America's first federal bird refuge. Pelican Island, Florida, had long been a favorite haven for beautiful shore and wading birds where mangroves hugged the waters of the small island. Pelicans, peafowls, flamingos, and spoonbills adorned the beach. Victorian ladies' hats also vied for the birds' beautiful adornments. The plumage was highly sought after in the name of elegance and fashion. Consequently, the birds were being killed by the tens of thousands to fulfill those vanities. During his time in office, Roosevelt had created 51 federal bird reservations, four national game preserves, 
150 national forests, and many more conservation projects that we take for granted today. Birds that are useless for the table and not harmful to the farm should always be preserved. And the more beautiful they are, the more carefully they should be preserved. They look a great deal better in the swamps and on the beaches and among the trees than they do on hats. As yet, with the great majority of our most interesting and important wild birds and beasts, the prime need is to protect them, not only by laws limiting the open season and the size of the individual bag, but especially by the creation of sanctuaries and refuges. The progress made in the United States of recent years in creating and policing bird refuges has been of capital importance. Laws to protect small and harmless wildlife, especially birds, are indispensable. Theodore Roosevelt created the first national park in North Dakota, one of five national parks added by Roosevelt. The relatively small 780 wooded acres near Devil's Lake suffered a rough start in size, funding, and management. In 1931, the national park designation was rescinded, the park becoming a game refuge under the aegis of the National Wildlife Refuge System. Today, Sully's Hill National Game Preserve has expanded to over 1,600 acres of prairie and woodland as a fascinating and picturesque home to a controlled number of bison and elk, a large herd of roaming deer, and a steady, impressive array of migratory birds. Those daring to make the steep climb up the actual Sully's Hill are treated to one of the state's remarkable views of a memorable nature preserve that Theodore Roosevelt believed in with his every fiber. It will be a real misfortune if our wild animals disappear from mountain, plain, and forest to be found only in game preserves. It is to the interest of all of us to see that there is ample and real protection for our game as for our woodlands. A true democracy really alive to its opportunities will insist upon such game preservation, for it is to the interest of our people as a whole. Conservation and rural life policies are really two sides to the same policy, and at bottom lies the fundamental law that neither man nor nature can prosper unless, in dealing with the present, thought is steadily given to the future. Twenty-four-year-old Theodore Roosevelt suffered a sorrow of volcanic proportions in February of 1884. Responding to an urgent cable from his brother, T.R. hastened from Albany to New York City, where his wife Alice lived with his mother, Mitty. Alice was in a dangerous state of health after giving birth to their first child. In another room, Mitty was on the threshold of death from Bright's disease. Roosevelt lost the two most important women of his life before dawn. In his February 14th diary, he penned, The light has gone out of my life. Broken in spirit, he sought solace months later in the alluring place he had discovered the previous year in the far west of Dakota Territory. Western Dakota's rugged backcountry, rivers, landscapes, and people helped set the stage for the healing drama that would change Roosevelt's life forever. I have always said I would not have been president had it not been for my experience in North Dakota. It was here that the romance of my life began. I grow very fond of this place, and it certainly has a desolate, grim beauty of its own that has a curious fascination to me. There are no words that can tell the hidden spirit of the wilderness that can reveal its mystery, its melancholy, and its charm. 
I do not believe there was any life more attractive to a vigorous young man than life on a cattle ranch in those days. It was a fine, healthy life, too. It taught a man self-reliance, hardihood, and the value of instant decision. I enjoyed that life to the fullest. I heartily enjoy this life with its perfect freedom. There are few sensations I prefer to that of galloping along those rolling limitless prairies with rifle in hand or winding my way along the barren, fantastic, and grimly picturesque deserts of that so-called bad land. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Dakota Datebook is produced in cooperation with the Historical Society of North Dakota. This series with funding from the Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation. And by the members of Prairie Public.